What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Push Through. Got JJ back. Missed you, bud. Missed you last week. That was a good episode last week, though. I'm glad you had the wife on. Yeah, I mean, I was actually, I kind of like brought it up as a joke, like, well, I'm going to go record by myself unless you want to come. And she's like, oh, I'll record. What do you want to talk about? The race? I'm like, I can send it. Yeah, it was perfect. Now we just got to get her to run that 100K. <laughs> well, I got her to sign up for uh, for that Backyard Ultra. Oh, so she, man. She's going to be doing that with me on December 9th. That's her birthday, too. Oh, that's awesome. I was like, you know what we should do on your birthday? We should um, we should run an ultra marathon. Heck yeah, dude. Before we dive into that, though, there's okay. something I couldn't wait to talk to you about. <clears throat> because as I guess, I, I think everybody knows that this started as a money podcast, right? right? And I still think, and I, I still firmly believe that if you have your money right, the rest of your life is going to be dope. It's going to be like, I think it's very, very important. I think it's just as important as fitness. I mean, real quick, just to bring up, speaking of your wife, one of the main reasons in the United States and probably around the world, why divorce rates are so high is because of finances. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, that's a, yeah. I mean, when you, when you have your money, right. And I think when we first started, Mr. Money Mustache was all the rage. Right. And yes, I remember seeing him speak once and he was like, everyone like wants to label me like this financial guru and they they think that i care about people's money like i don't give a shit about your money right but what i do know is that when people have their money right they're happier and i want a happier world so if i got to get to a happy if that's my angle to a happier world is at helping people get their money right then so be it right well i tell you all that to tell you all this okay seeing Corey's post yesterday in the oh, discord yeah. like besides the fact that the dude has been supporting us supporting you and i separately supporting podcasts supporting average money supporting the youtube channel like the dude i think he pays for all of our discords you know to see him become debt free and pay his mortgage off like I don't think that words, and I'm glad we get to talk about it because I mean, we post like, congratulations, bud. Right. Good work, you know, but I don't think that you can write in text in a discord or portray how much, I, I'm not speaking for you, but how much it fires me up. Like, I love clapping when people win and I don't want people to think that I've forgotten about money and personal finance because we're talking about running and fitness. Like the fitness part is just the evolution. Absolutely. And all of that fitness and evolution is built on the foundation that you and I, we focus very, very strongly on having our money right. And you have a paid off mortgage. I personally don't have a paid off mortgage. And we can discuss that for anybody that's kind of new to the podcast on why. I used but, to. Yeah. Now I don't well, have anything. <laughs> yeah, now you don't have anything. <laughs> now you're homeless. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, it's isn't it? it like I said, Corey's, I, we've been around for so long. Like I've been watching Corey's yeah. story now and it's just. Well, to and to of, add to, to that, go ahead, to yeah. add to that, he's also running now. He ran his first 5k yes. the other day, right? On his, it was his birthday. On his birthday. So look at this fucking day that this guy had. <laughs> he had a birthday, which I mean, as I get older, I'm a grown man. I've heard Joe Rogan say that men shouldn't get excited about their birthdays. Fuck that. I love getting excited about my birthday, <laughs> you know, but uh birthday first 5k and he paid off his mortgage yo dude so, hey. that's a day that that is a day dude that's awesome man he I mile mean, he mile streaked for like a month two leading into it mm -hmm. so he just get off the couch and go over he's been run he bought a garmin yeah. like and now he doesn't have a mortgage i mean more props to you my man like that's so awesome to see and it's not like i mean and and not to like downplay paying off debt and stuff but dude play, paying off your your freaking mortgage that's life changing life changing that's the one of your biggest expenses in life is is your mortgage yes and the fact that that's gone the dude got a a major pay raise yeah, major I mean, pay raise he he bought back freedom is what he did i mean let's say on the low end his mortgage was $1000 a month Right. He's got himself a $12,000 raise. Unreal. And I bet you it was a little more than a thousand. He'll tell us in the discord if he wants. How, he doesn't have it anymore. I'm sure he could tell us, but yeah, I mean, if it was 
a thousand dollars a month of a mortgage, that's a twelve thousand dollar. That's he can essentially go on a twelve thousand dollar vacation this year and feel no different in lifestyle. Yeah, and he's so young. Oh god, so young, dude. Like he has the rest of his life to never have to pay a mortgage again. Yeah, it's unreal. Un- and he can look. I mean, and the, it's funny okay. because our evolution is. I go through like cycles and then like I get FOMO, you know, like hearing him pay his mortgage off. I'm like, when you paid yours off, I'm like, oh man, should I just pay it off? And then uh, then I like do the math. Here's the short story for anybody that doesn't know. I refied at the bottom. I have a stupid low interest rate. I I do not know the official number, but it's under 3%. I want to say 2.85 or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's tough. I'm also liquid. I'm also liquid the amount of my payoff. So if something were to happen to my job or something like that, I could pay off my mortgage to make my life a little bit easy because we've discussed like paying off your mortgage should be definitely interest rate based, but it should also be based Especially on in this environment. It should be based on income and stuff like that. Like because I'm liquid and can pay it off and I have a low interest rate, I personally with my experience in personal finance know that I could probably get a better return on my money and that that's going to be okay. I also have a 15 year term, which I'm already accelerating it and getting it off. I'm paid off. And my job security is pretty strong. Like I don't need to free that money up in case of, you know, a fickle financial situation, which was kind of the thing that drove you to pay yours off is you said, Hey, I got this YouTube thing. I'm working for myself. My wife's working part time. I love the YouTube thing, but if something she were to happen, oh, she wasn't even working then. No. So you were like, "Hey, I could pay this mortgage off, and then if we have a down month in YouTube or something like that, you'd be so." It's not as cut and dry as you should pay off your mortgage. Right. I mean, Absolutely. We are examples of that, but that doesn't mean, like I consider myself not having a mortgage really, even though I do because I am liquid. It, but seeing him pay it off, I'm like. That is a feeling I have not felt in life. Like I, I know what it's like to be consumer debt free. I haven't had any debt besides my mortgage since September of 2018. But no, uh, 9, 18, 19, my son was born in 19. So September 19th, I became debt free consumer debt wise, my truck, personal loans and student loans, credit cards, things like that. But yeah, like I, that's, I know I'll get there, but that's got to What's that feeling like, dude? What's it like? I mean, there's for you, I guess it'd be a little different because you still have really high property taxes and stuff. But like, dude, like when I paid mine off, I literally told myself every almost every bill I have now, besides like electric and internet and phone and shit, I said I could live on nothing for a month if I really needed to, because I have nothing to pay for now. We all know I got kids, you know, you got food and stuff like that. But re- like, realistically, if I needed to have a bone dry month of not spending money, I'd have a few bills I'd have to pay for. And that's it. Yeah, like And it's just a, it's a freedom. It's a feeling of freedom, dude. Like no one, I don't owe a single person, a single dollar besides like my mortgages on my rental properties, which my tenants pay for those. Like, it's it's an incredible feeling. It's awesome. It's just, it's freedom. It's like, you know, when you're out running on your run and you get that quick runner's high, it's like that. I mean, it's just, uh, it's well, an it's, amazing. And, and it's like that uh, reel that you posted last week where like you dropped Mace off at school and you're all scrubbed out and you see all these dads coming in with like their ties oh. on and their uniforms and their scrubs. And you're like, man, am I, am I supposed to be going to work right now? And then you're that like, was a, that was a messed up, thought man like that was a messed up feeling i had it was weird i never thought i'd like i don't know it was i was walking it was while i was walking millie into school and dropped her off and when i was walking out I, and and in the story on my instagram it shows are the the real it shows like t-shirt running shorts and flip-flops i mean i look at my hair was all messed up like i just woke out of got out of bed and then i walk out of the daycare and i'm getting ready to go on a run and do some stuff and I see these three dads walk in all in a row. One of them was in his pilot uniform. The other one was in scrubs and the other one was in business attire. And 
I like I walked out and I had this like it was almost like a like a how do I explain this? Like I'm not I wasn't like do, doing what I was supposed to do as a dad. Yeah, because inherently you are very traditional and you're like, absolutely, I'm the man of the house. I provide. Yeah. And you've done, I mean, you front loaded a lot of work and you just sold a tech company and, you know, you're, you're providing, but yeah. And, you it, know, you yeah. Know, it was weird though, dude. Like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm about to go home. Uh, you know, I, I, like, I got a couple things on my to do list today. Like, put a bookshelf up that's gonna be it's gonna be on your to-do list <laughs> no but i mean even you being in florida you know to yeah. circle back to this mortgage thing you know most people now that everyone's talking about like oh my house tripled in price in in three years and most people are like yeah i could sell my house for this but they still have to take a large chunk of that and pay their mortgage off where you were like hey do you want to go travel nurse and move around the country and do you want to maybe take a shot living in Florida? Like, let's set, just sell our house and we don't have a mortgage. So that's all going in our pocket. And that was before you sold the company. So it gave you literally like three or four years salary to figure it out. Your wife yeah. was going to go back to work. You didn't have any, like when you said that like, you can live on nothing, like a bare bones month for you was still like minimum wage. We're talking like, oh, you, you could probably live off of under $2,500 a month. I mean, like- oh. In Missouri, I mean, yeah, less than that. Yeah. If I if we needed to, yeah. And I said with your work ethic and like you know what it's like to hustle. You've always been a hustler, so it's like without that mortgage, you're like I could go work at Starbucks and still like put money on the table if I really needed to. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, that's that's awesome. I I, I just we get so much good news inside the Discord, and whether it's our personal ones or whether it's push throughs, it's. I just wanted to say out loud so Corey could hear me say it. Like, good on you, bud. Likewise. Good, good on you. Cause that's shout like, out to Corey. Yeah, fair play, man. That's just awesome. And I look forward to, you know, hearing more stories. Cause we have been getting DMs of people like working out and things like that and uh finding that angle of fitness. And man, this is a good time of year to run. You know, they say some what do they say? Summer miles bring false miles. Like Oh, I like that. Oh, dude, today. I, and today I ran on the treadmill cause my wife is working tonight. And, uh, but like yesterday I got out and it's 55 degrees and sunny with a slight breeze. You go out, go out with shorts on and maybe like a long sleeve, like loose base layer or a tech shirt. And it's like, you just feel like you could run forever. Yeah. It's seventies every day down here now. It's like fifties in the morning. Fifties in the morning. Yeah. And then seventies during the day. That's awesome. Yeah, it's like perfect weather. Man, I still feel like we have so much we could talk about. What's do do you want it? Can you talk? I don't know like what your NDAs are. Can you talk about the sale of that business? Cause I don't even think we ever did. Or do you just not feel comfortable with it or out of respect for your partners and stuff? We just I mean, they know you own the dividend tracker, but like maybe I'm trying to think of like the educational piece that we could bring to the table of like anybody that's thinking about starting it or like what it's like to get out of a business. Cause I've gotten out of two businesses now and the process is generally should be smooth. Sometimes it's not smooth, but there's definitely tough conversations and negotiations and things like that. Um, I, I just don't know how, I don't know if we've ever talked about it and I don't know how deep you want to go, but. Yeah. I mean, I can't talk like price and stuff, but um, I mean, I can talk about pretty much anything else. So uh, I, yeah, go ahead. So like, I mean, basically this, this, I think probably the hardest part was the decision, mm -hmm. the, the decision one to even bring up the conversation. Cause it was my idea and the decision of also deciding what I felt my part was worth and getting that valuation. And then third, um, the decision on how it was all going to play out. Yeah. So it was like a three step part of there. And the first part being the decision to even do it to 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 exit the company was for a multi, multiple reasons some of them were personal with moving um a new start um a couple other things within the business 
Um, everything was going great. Business was doing great and the business, you know, still growing. I just personally felt like it wasn't really, it wasn't for me anymore. The part I was doing, I got back to doing a job that I didn't want to do. I woke up and I was like, this isn't, yeah. I'm not excited anymore. And I always told myself, if I don't like something, even if that's going to hinder my my income or my future net worth, I don't care. I don't care. Like money's important to me, but happiness is 10 times more important. So there was just a few things. And then also like financial reasons too. Like the company was starting to grow to be a, a very significant amount of my net worth. And I also looked at it as like, what would happen if this company, let's say something something bad happened yeah. and the value of the company just plummeted back down to damn near nothing. I couldn't take that risk. Yeah. I couldn't. Couldn't do it. Um now if I had if I had some more stuff set in stone or if I was, you know, if it wasn't as as large as it got, then maybe it'd be okay and I would take the risk. But I kind of wanted to get out while it was good for me. And like I said, the company was doing fine. The company was doing great. And the company is still growing, which I think I hope my partners sell it for much more than I got. Mm-hmm. But for me, it was this uh, it was the right time, right place, and I have zero regrets on on leaving. Um so that was the first part was just deciding that and talking it over with Lindsay. And then with that, I knew though, and even Bryce, my partner, asked me, he's like, well, what are you going to do after this? And I was like, that's a great question, dude. I was like, I have some ideas, but I don't really know. So that was also in the back of my head because I've been a guy that's always been working nonstop, always. Like I've always had something I'm building, working on. And this was the first time in my life where I literally had like nothing going on, like nothing that I was like, like I needed to grow, you know, like nothing that was paying my bills and I had to keep doing it for that bills to be paid. Like that was the first time I've ever, I guess, officially been financially free, if you want to call it. So the next part was like, okay, well, pricing, how how is that going to figure out? And that was kind of back and forth between certain ratios to look at and businesses, but I can't, I don't really want to get into that just for sake of partners and stuff like that. Um, And then third, was the negotiations on how it was going to happen. I kind of had my terms that I thought were pretty fair since I was kind of throwing these, that I was throwing this on my partners. For those that don't know, I called my partners and said, Hey, I kind of want out. So I, I, I put that into the formula of how I came up with what I came up with. And uh, both partners seemed that was pretty fair. And then the structure of the deal, we had to work on a little bit, um, just based on, you know, borrowing money, lending terms, stuff like that, valuations of the business. So that was something we had to discuss in negotiations as well. Again, I can't really get into the details of how the deal was was played out, but, um, but yeah, man, it, it, the negotiation part was actually it was not bad, and I think a lot of that was because of. I was friends with my original partner and I still am to this day. And I told him from the very first phone call, I was like, dude, I do not want this to go South. Like I want us to work together, even though there was a little, not, there wasn't arguments, but there was, there was times in the negotiations where I agreed with something and he agreed with something else. And that was kind of tough to navigate, but we both kept a clear head on. We both were not being arrogant or not being not, you know, neither one of us were, not being unfair. And we both recognized that, which helped also. So that really helped keep negotiations clean. Yeah. Um, lawyers got involved, muddied the waters a little bit as they always do, but nothing too, too concerning, nothing too crazy. I think both sides knew that the deal was going to get done. It was just a matter of a few, few minor things. And then, yeah, dude, I mean the, the actual, like the actual day it happened, you would expect like, something big to happen or whatever. But I think I posted on my Instagram, a a picture. We were actually going, the family and I drove to Panama city 
because we knew we were going to be signing. I was going to be signing papers and closing was going to be happening. So we were driving to Panama city to celebrate and just to have like a random quick trip. So as we're driving, I told Lindsay, I was like, sorry, you're going to have to drive because I know these papers are going to come in. I got to have to e-sign them and then send this back in. She's like, yeah, no problem. So she's you know driving five hours to, to Panama city and I'm sitting here waiting on the email and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm like, boom, there it is. Sign the papers. You know, money was wired that day. And I looked at Lindsay, I was like, I would have expected this to be a lot more exciting instead of sitting in a passenger seat in a car in the middle of nowhere, Florida, <laughs> you know, like, um, but then, you know, the family and I celebrated and we had a good time and I checked something off my list that I never thought I would have been able to do, you know, just, I mean, selling a business. So that was pretty cool, man. And, and I'll be honest with you though, I've had some mental so now fast forward, now the business has been sold. I've had some free time. As we know, I've really been working on fitness and running and found this brand new hobby and whatnot, but I have had some mental battles of kind of what I'm going to do next. And I think that plays into the fact of like who I am as a person. I'm always a person, like I said before, I've always had something going on. I've always had something I'm working on, whatever. And I've also had that like I said before, it was something that drove me because I needed to have it. I had to pay bills. I had to feed my family like that drove me. But now I'm kind of like can relax a little bit. And I don't know how to turn off that part of my brain where it's like, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. So it's been a big struggle. And then also, when, which I didn't think this would kind of bother me. But like when, when I'm talking, like we meet, we've been meeting a lot of new people down here. And guys, you know, first question they always ask, oh, what do you do? I'm like, well, I run. <laughs> no, like, what do you say to that? So you, that's say I'm, because, you say I'm retired. Well, I mean, or I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, sometimes I tell people that I'm, uh, Lindsay call said I'm fun employed. F U N instead of unemployed. Fun employed. So, like, I like that. I use that sometimes because, like, sometimes I'm, I'm self employed. Yeah, that too. And like, sometimes I just don't want people like to know either. Like, I mean, that sounds weird because I'm literally broadcasting this on a podcast, but like, it's different when you're meeting people in, in, in personal life, you know, it's just, I don't want to come off like, I don't know. It's so it's, tell, it, that's tell people you're a teacher because nobody ever wants to talk to a teacher. <laughs> okay. I'll start using whenever, that. <laughs> whenever somebody's like, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, oh, I'm a teacher. They're like, okay, cool. I got, oh wait. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'll be right there. Hold I, on. I'll, I'll be, be right back. back. <laughs> But like, I'm like, oh yeah, do the YouTube thing. Oh, what's that like? What's that? Yeah. Yep. You can be whatever you want, man. Uh, so that's, that's been the biggest thing. I was like the, the mental fact of it and like what I'm doing next, what the next game plan is. Cause I know I can't just like sit on my ass and do nothing. Um, I have been trying to take this time though to really like, as people have seen on Instagram and stuff, like really hone in on fitness. I found a new love for running, which never thought that would have happened in my life. And it's just, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a cool time right now, dude. Like I'm getting to spend more time with my kids. Um, it's, it's pretty like if you would have told if you, so for, here's a cool story real quick on my Facebook, you know, how I don't know if you're on Facebook at all, but like memories pop up every now and then it's like six years ago, you did this. So I had one pop up, uh, two weeks ago, maybe a week ago. And it said six years ago was this and it was a picture and i don't know if i've ever told you this story so Lindsay and i were living in kansas city at the time and we just moved back mason was probably three months old around there four months old we moved back home to Lindsay's hometown to be closer to family and when that happened i quit my engineering job at kansas city so i was i was unemployed i wasn't working but that was because Lindsay had a job lined up in st louis as a nurse so we're like, okay, cool. She's got her job. We'll live at your we'll live in your dad's basement for like a month until we can find a place to rent. We're good. We move to Missouri, sell our house. Well, you know, everything's good to go. We get into her dad's basement. Boom. Lindsay gets some email saying, Hey, sorry. We've had to pull your job off her. Some things happen. Now we are both unemployed and living in her dad's basement. And we're like 20, 25 at this time, I think. So like you know, don't have a pot to piss in besides whatever money we made from our house selling that. 
And we're just like, shit, what are we, do- what are we gonna do? We got a four month old, us two, like we can't live in your dad's basement forever. Like we gotta figure out what the hell we're gonna do. So fast forward to where the picture was from on Facebook with the memories popping up, it showed a picture of a house. And you know, you said hustler and stuff like, dude, I was like, I'm not going to not make money, you know, while my wife and baby's sitting here in a, in the basement of her dad's house. I found a post on Craigslist back when Craigslist was a thing. And it said uh, like uh, construction help or remodel help or whatever. Well, I knew I wanted to get into real estate, right? So I was like, oh, cool. Maybe this guy's an investor and he needs help remodeling, whatever. So I, I show I he, or he calls me, inter- like does like a little weird interview, didn't really do anything. It was just like, hey, who are you? Whatever. He's like, all right, come here. I'll pay you cash. Show up. So then I showed up and I was just helping the guy remodel, like, you know, clean up trash, fixing his deck, power washing, uh, remodeling a bathroom, some stuff like that. Just random shit. So I took a picture of the house and I posted on Facebook. I was like, hey, everyone, thank you. Because I made a post like locally, like anyone looking for work, I'm here. Like I can do whatever. So I was like, just thank you. And I'm like, this is the house I'm I'm helping remodel currently. So I saw that and I'm like, holy shit, dude. Six years ago today, I was helping remodel a house. And get this, the guy he hired to be like my partner, because the dude would just kind of show up in the morning, the owner of the house. He would just show up. Tell us what he wanted us to get done for the day, and he would leave. So this other guy who was my partner for the day uh, just got out of jail. Had, you know, skinhead, had the tats everywhere, and just drank like a freaking, I don't even know what you call it. The dude would like bring a case of beer and like hide it from the guy until he left, and he would crack open beer as we were working. I had some beers too, <laughs> not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> but dude, it was just a, it was a weird time, man. Like it was such a weird time, but it was so cool though to look back on that and be like, holy shit, just six years ago, my wife and I were both unemployed. I was hustling to make some cash, had a three month, you know, four month old baby living in her dad's basement. Six years later, I sold a tech company, living a pretty decent life. Yeah, and you know, I, and all the highs and lows I had in between there from YouTube, from starting Dividend Tracker, and all this other stuff, dude. It's just, uh, it's been a wild ride for the past six years. So much stuff I want to circle back on, but that's that memories thing. That's the same as why I still write in that journal every day. Yeah, you know, because yep. absolutely, I'm gonna get one of those in my own handwriting and my own interpretations and things like that. But what I want to circle back to is, you know, we had very similar situations and throughout the sale, you know, we talked about things and you mostly asked about my experiences with selling businesses. And, um, we talked a lot about selling on the way up and I sold the brewery on the way up and everybody called me a donkey. Even my wife was like, Brad, is this smart? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like we were literally quadrupling revenue yearly in our sixth year. We, and, um, it's, it's so hard, but I needed, like you said, I needed the time. I, I needed to take the sacrifice. And if I would have worried about how much money Chris is going to make or will make when he sells Dubco, I, I don't know if I would have been able to do that. Like you really, I guess the advice and the, the learning piece is, and we learned this from John Scholler very early. And that was, he helped me that what he said in that simple moment that, you know, that was one of the things that pushed me to be, make the decision I did. And he was like, if the deal's a good deal for you, it doesn't matter what the deal is for anybody else. And I think he used a car example. He's like, if there was a million dollar car and the guy was selling it for nine, uh, was selling it for 500 K, would you buy the car? Hell yeah, you would. It's half off. He goes, but if you found out that the guy got it as a gift, and he didn't pay anything for it. And he was going to make 500 K. Do you still want the car? And most people would be like, no, F that guy. He got it for free. Like, and they would lose out on that once amazing deal, which was the same deal in their own head because they were worried about what somebody else was. And if you're going to sell a business and this is kind of where we got, it was like, if you receive an amount of money or whatever terms it is, 
and you are happy with those terms, it does not matter what the other person is going to get. And when you also put that aside, it makes it so much easier to be happy and proud of them when they did. Mm -hmm. My first business, it, 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 the breakup wasn't a good breakup. And I spent so many years not wanting it to fail, but like not giving a shit. Right. I, I always, I don't want anybody to be out of work. I didn't want them to lose the business, but I didn't care about its perpetual growth. And if I would have been spiteful of Chris or worried about what Chris was making, then I wouldn't be able to support him when I see that he bought a 35 acre farm literally the year after I got bought out. And now that place has a restaurant. He's got two locations. He's got 10 staff. He's distrib distributed in pretty much every state. And if I would have worried like, man, when Chris is distributing every state and has a rough farm and a, and a thing and he's a multimillionaire, I'm going to be so upset because I, I could have stayed in. Like, you can't think like that. Mm -mm. And, you know, and I say like, Friends become partners is weird. Um, but you mentioned you guys always communicate. I think that's something that Chris and I, we were good communicators. Even when we were biting each other's heads off, we never like had like that build up, build up, build up, start gossiping behind each other's backs, well, start com that's... complaining about like the wives. Like when, when we were pissed off at each other, we were able to do that. And that communication really, really helped when we had to sit down and sign paperwork because we knew each other were being honest with one another. I think that's one of the most important things with partners and businesses is like you have to keep that. It's like a marriage. Yeah. I mean, you're literally married to that other individual business wise, and you need to keep that con that conversation open, talking about like, hey, and do it when you know whenever it's you're both in a good mood. Like, hey, man, just want to check in, make sure everything's good. And there would be times where Bryce and I were like, hey, we need to figure something out about this. Like, this is something that's bugging me. And I've mentioned it a couple of times or whatever it is, vice versa. And we both would figure it out. We're like, oh, OK, yeah, man, let's let's find a solution, you know, and yeah. and it, that does make it harder if you have a partner who's not willing to communicate. Like, that's kind of like, you know, hopefully you pick the right one type deal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the communication thing and, and having that open line and also, you know, turning back and coming back around to saying how important communication is. And there'd be times where Bryce and I would be like, Hey, listen, dude, like I just want to make sure we're staying good. Everything's you know clear and open and talking about anything you need or whatever it is. And I think that is super important in and anything, then, uh, marriage, yeah. business, whatever it is. And I think something else that's overlooked in business with partners is establishing roles early. So true. And, and not getting mad at the other party when you wanted to change the roles mm -hmm. kind of in a marriage like my my wife and i we have roles and it's not because we're male female it's just like what we like yeah. like i mow the lawn she vacuums the house if one day i came at her and was like yo why haven't you mowed the lawn she's like that's not that's not what i do well, <laughs> well i'm right. i'm sick of mowing the lawn now you have to she's like no i didn't that's not like what i signed up for like if Tara and I got married under the pretense that we were going to smoke cigarettes our whole lives and I quit and wanted her to quit, you know, you can't, you can't have that. And right. it's, it's a long time to change roles, but like, and this, I'm speaking from experience because <clears throat> this was one thing that Chris and I, this was one of the things that we would butt heads about. I would tend to micromanage him or I would tend to blame him or, or I think, yeah, micromanage the things he was doing or think that I had a better decision and he'd be like, no, no, you're all, yeah. you, know? you yeah. know, or I would hire a bartender because I was more front of the house. I would hire a bartender. He's like, why'd you hire that person? I would, I'm like, no, you're all, you know, and when, when you can establish those roles and not get mad when the other person, like write them down, like you, you are going to make bylaws, like write down, like Brad, his role is to edit every single episode and post every single episode, Right. So that when I come to you and I'm like, yo, you piece of shit, you never helped me edit. You're like, that's not what I signed up for. You know? Right. Exactly. And like, I couldn't, I couldn't get mad because we've established roles and you and Bryce did like an awesome job of doing that. And one of the things that I saw and that you kind of said was like, you didn't like your place in that role. So instead of 
saying to Bryce, you need to start making content and you need to start being more of like a, a public face in this business. Instead of you saying that and blaming him for not helping you, you just said, Hey guys, I need to be replaced because I can no longer fulfill my role. Right. And when I had to say to Chris, Chris, the business is growing so much that I am a hindrance to your business. My salary is hurting the business mm -hmm. because I don't have enough time with my job and my other hobbies to do my job, to fulfill, fulfill my roles. And because I'm taking such a large salary, I, we can't hire people to help me. So I'm going to step away and then you could take my salary and you can buy someone that did my role and then everything else. And that's kind of why I had to go. Cause I couldn't be like, I've run the tasting room for 10 years, but now I'm sick of it. So I'm going to brew and you're going to do right. the tasting room. It's like, no, nah, right. dude, that's not how it works. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, and it's like you said, you can't just go change those things, you know, right off the bat. And, uh, every business has what's called an operating agreement and everything that you guys talk about or decide or agree on needs to be in writing in that operating agreement. I don't care if it's with your best friend, mm -hmm. you need to have it in writing. So that way, whenever something does come up and there's an argument or whatever it is, you pull that paper up and you're like, listen, dude, this yeah. is the agreement. We both signed it legally documented. Like there's nothing else we can really, like there's no argument. There's no argument to be had because it's in writing. When you get to that, it's in writing conversation, nine times out of 10, the it's, other parties, the other party's going to be like, yeah, you're right. Yep. Let's, let's, and that can <clears throat> open negotiation to changing those operating agreements. But like, yeah, having it in writing eliminates the, he said, she said it mm -hmm. eliminates the, that's not how the conversation went, you know? And yeah. It, and it could be as very simple as I'm going to edit and put, I'm going to edit and post all of the episodes. And then you saying, I will try and make reels and shorts when I can, you know, like mm -hmm. that simple things that people be like, Oh, we, we don't need to talk about that. My first business was literally a kid that I grew up in and lived in my house. We went on family vacations and literally one day ended 10 years of like brotherhood friendship because we didn't write things down. You know, mm -hmm. now it's any, any agreement I go into with anybody, you know, and it's the first thing, like, let's, let's establish roles and get an operating agreement. People are like, yo, man, it's not that serious. And I'm like, actually it, it is. Yeah, it is that sure. Serious. Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100%. So yeah, dude. Um, anyways, I'm living life and, and running. So All right, now, of, yeah, now we need to know about the running. Yeah. So that's some of I've been excited to talk about. <laughs> So as some of you know, some of you may not know, I have had been dealing with a knee injury from running. And I think a lot of it was from just ramping up miles too quick, too fast, too much, and also not knowing what the hell I was doing. When I first started running, all I knew was I put on my shoes, I go out and I run and I run the distance that I have, I've, you know, allotted for that day. I come in posted on Strava because I guess that's what you have to do as a runner nowadays. And then, then that's it. Well, after doing that for so long, ramping up distances, not doing it the proper way, proper form, I started getting a knee injury or knee pain and it kept getting worse and worse until finally got so bad where I couldn't even run. I mean, I would take five steps and it was just shooting pain. So then I took like four or five weeks off and I ended up coming back to running, started up again. I was walking during that time of like the four to six weeks of, of break, walking the dog, you know, three, four miles just because I needed to move my body. And then after a while, I was like, screw this. I got to, I got to, I got to get back to it. Started running again and no time the, the knee pain was, was coming back. It, it arrived back. And then finally I was like, screw this. Like I... I had races I've signed up for. I had my, I got a 10 miler. I have a race for coming up next weekend. And I was supposed to be training for that. So then I took another two weeks off because the pain popped up, back up again. And then now just recently I went to see uh, PT because I was like, I got I to get this figured out. Got to get it figured out. Went to the PT appointment. And she pretty much said what I thought was, you know, mainly the PT appointment. I want to make sure there was no tissue issues Nothing seemed like she out of the ordinary where she's like, hey, you may need to go get an MRI on this. So checked all that out. She said, oh, yeah, you're good. 
you, you know, you got some strength issues you need to work on. You have some mobility issues you need to work on. She goes, and then we looked at my form and she's like, holy shit, you got some big issues you got to work on with this. So basically come down to it. I'm a heel striker, a bad heel striker. And she took video of my running form and, you know, you guys got to think I'm, I'm coming from a background. I'm never running in my life. I didn't know. I, literally I put on shoes and just go. So when she showed me the video, she took a second video explaining just a couple pointers of what to what to work on. And those were higher cadence, shorter strides, lifting my heels up closer to my butt and leaning forward a little bit. And all those put into action, 15 seconds of her explaining it to me. I had the Metro. What is it? Metro phone. Is that what it's called? Metro. Metronome. At 170 beats per minute, and I was just boom in place, bop, 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 and she showed me the after video, and I was I was amazed at how much it improved, just from her few critiques. <clears throat> so now I have a little workout plan for running. I have uh, one of my I did my first one today. It was a one mile jog and a two mile walk. Do that for ten rounds, uh, or I'm sorry, did I say miles? I meant minutes. A one minute run, jog, and then a two minute walk or rest. So did that for 10 rounds, ended up being exactly two miles or so, 30 minute workout, and it felt good. Uh I I kept my 170 beats per minute playing in my my headphones for the entire 30 minutes. Thought I was gonna shoot myself, but it did help. Um as soon as I started running, I tried to get on pace as best I could. And I really had to think about lifting my heels. That was probably the hardest part that I noticed in my running form that I've never done before. I never lift my heels up. Yeah. It's weird. It's very weird. But then, so I noticed my, my hamstrings glutes, which have always been pretty weak on me were already, I could feel them like getting sore, not sore, but like I could feel the uncomfortableness in them. So like, that's something I'm going to need to work on strength wise. But as I was doing this, I, I did feel so much lighter on my feet. I felt easy, not easier to run because it did feel very uncomfortable. It felt weird, but I just, I, you know, how you, you've said this before, Brad, you're like, you feel it almost like you're floating. Yeah. I'm not floating, but I'm almost there. Like, I, like, I mean, this was my first practice run. So like, I'm a little rusty, but like, I did feel a huge change and just the placement of where my feet were landing. But the one thing I wanted to ask you, and I want your opinion on is every time I did that one minute run and I was at the cadence, boom, 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 boom. I could not slow down. Like I was looking at my heart rate spiking. I was looking at my, my pace spiking. And I was like, how in the hell do I slow down, but keep all this shit going at the same, like I want to run like 11 minute pace and I couldn't do it. I could yeah. not do it at that pace. All right. So yeah. here's, here's like that, but I want to circle to like one thing first. It's um, <laughs> two things with the metronome. It sounds ridiculous, dude. Like I'll rap to myself. Cause you have that metronome and it's like yeah. just a little baseline, like just oh, spit oh, bars oh, about, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's yeah. But and the other thing is like the floating thing is I try and like relate it to or compare it to if you've like ever played baseball and just connected with one mm -hmm. or like golf, like you hit that drive square off the club and you just knew that like it was one of those special moments mm -hmm. when, when the mechanics start to come together with running, it, it all just, it, yeah, it feels like just all together. But it takes time, and it's it's one of those things where it's you don't even know it's happening, and then you just you like look around or you just get aware, and you're like, oh my god! The, the first time I felt like that was really in Oregon, in August. I'm sorry, that, where? In Oregon, in in Oregon, 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 no. Oregon, whatever, Oregon, like your organ donor, Oregon, whatever. Yeah, Oregon. Yeah. Okay. Oregon. Oregon. So, and like, that's a year and a half. And those races where I was like doing six mile runs at seven fifteen pace. And I was like, I've never run faster than eight minute miles in my life. Right. You know, and there was all, but it was the time there was a lot of foundational work and that boring. So how did, hang on though. How did you slow down or are you getting okay. there? Yeah, I'm getting there. Okay. I just want to remind people that like, don't 
look at somebody's step 10 if you're on step one. Like, mm-hmm. know that there's foundational work in everything. There's annoying work in anything. And by the time social media shows you to somebody, they've already gone through all of that. So that's right. like kind of like the fun part about watching yours. Mm-hmm. So one major thing that I learned, and this relates still back to that, how do I slow down? is every stride feels like you're trying to throw a dollar bill backwards or like you're on a skateboard, like that kind of feel Mm -hmm. where like if you were on a skateboard, you wouldn't put your leg out in front of you and then pull your leg through. For sure. You would kind of lead with your knee a little bit and that's what the hip flexor does. And then you'd start that backstroke and contact the ground in motion, just like a skateboard. Well, then you realize with that, that contact time and how hard you would push a skateboard and how high your knees are coming, meaning how far is that stride behind you? Cause right. You're not going to, you're not striding out. You're hitting the ground right under your body mass. Well, you get all of that power through the road into that back kick. So to go slower, it's kind of like bunting or taking a three quarter swing or, you know, just giving it like a half golf swing, like maybe like a nine iron swing the cadence stays higher but the pull through the ground and the follow through with that heel to your butt just shrinks down your stride becomes sm- uh your your stride becomes a little bit smaller um and that's really what you do and it it feels more like you're like bouncing when you slow down like that and you try and like like you're walking on eggshells or whatnot dude when i was running today <laughs> I was like, if anyone is looking at me right now running, they're like, what in the fuck is that guy doing? Dude, it felt so unnatural. Yeah. So unnatural. It does. And it it feels unnatural. I said, while you're thinking about it, but Mm -hmm. the more you do it. And like, I think really when you stop thinking about it, that's really when it improves. Kind of like in darts, you just go up there. When you just go up there and throw it, you hit the bullseye. When you're like, thinking about like every, how's every angle where's my you know that's when you're gonna like just cause yourself more stress than you need to and you'll get to a point where you've done it i i talked about my progression from 140 to 150 160 70 cadence and it just gets to a point where just like managing heart rate you just know like i can tell my cadence now without looking at my watch Mm -hmm. but it took seven months of building 10 beats per minute a month on a metronome for the whole month, every run to, uh, to get there. And now I, I, my cadence is in the one eighties where a year goes in the one forties and that's helped out the glutes, helped out my knees, helped out everything. And, but that contact time under your body is so important and it feels so weird. Very weird. But I can tell like, like you said, you know how when you, you make that connection to a ball and a bat or whatever, and it's just the, the right hit. I can tell what I'm doing. Like I've had that that thought in my head. I'm like, okay, I can see how this is going to improve. Like I compared it to what my running form was previously. And like, although that feels natural to me, I also see why my stuff is hurting. Yeah. And then when I do this, I'm like, wow, I... Because before, dude, I was so heavy on my feet, so heavy. And like for my height, like I'm a heavy guy, like, like I'm, I'm five, eight, five, nine, 200. Well, now I'm like 200 pounds, maybe like, I mean, it should be actually be like 195. I need to weigh that. <laughs> but I was like 210, you know, when I first started running and for my short stature, like that's a decent amount of weight. And if I'm like you said, when you saw the video, you're like, dude, you were literally stabbing your leg. For the past 400 miles you've ran this year you were you weren't like you weren't like four footing you were like literally like if you were if you were in the sand it looked like you were jumping and trying to see how far you could dig your front leg into the sand that's why she says she's like oh my god dude (laughs) you're a fucking disaster (laughs) it's like when you see like a a torn acl in slow-mo and like nfl you're like (laughs) oh you go to those running things and you do you like you get on there and then they put it in slow-mo and you're like my ankle does that Dude. every single step. I know it's not. And I've ran Carnage. four. I think I've ran 400 miles this year or maybe that's a lifetime on Strava. Dude, and you can do this at home. If you have a treadmill, put your phone on slow-mo yeah. on just your ankles and run at not too fast, not too slow, like a good forever pace. 
and then go back and watch it. It's crazy. And then you're like, that's why every NBA player has custom orthotics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and I looked at that and she's like, yeah, that's one of the big reasons why your knee is yeah. doing what it's doing. So it is what it is, dude. But now I got some work ahead of me. I have, I, I will say this, the hardest part with this is taking a, a major step back in my running career, whatever you want to call it. Um, Cause I really do want to focus on getting this form down and this workout stuff she gave me is just, you know, walk, run, walk, run, walk, run intervals. And it picks up as the, if it picks up, if the knee pain doesn't come up, but with that, I, I am going to run the 10 mile race. Yep. <laughs> She said you're not going to hurt the knee anymore. She said you may flare up the pain again. And yeah, because you're, like, you're not injured. You're just have absolutely. irritations and inflammations. Yep. So she's like, you, if you want to do the race, she's like, you can. She goes, I wouldn't advise it. Um, if you want your injury or you know your stuff to to heal up faster, um, because all you're going to do is just hinder it longer. Um, but she's like, if you are okay with that then yeah, by all means run your 10 mile race. But so I'm going to do, I want to do it. I want to do the race. If I have to walk, jog, walk, jog the entire race, whatever, like I'm probably not going to PR my time or anything, which is, you know, whatever, but I, it's a race I signed up. It's a, it's, I've been itching to do a race. I've been just wanting to do it ever since Mason and I did that 5k back on July 4th. That was our first race we've ever done. And I've been wanting to do one so bad ever since that was a little longer distance. My mom's going to be in town and I'm like, I, I got to do this. I've Is got it a to. road or a trail? It's a road. Nice. Yeah. Dude, so, yeah, no, it's going to be good. But just remember, uh, you have an A race and that block starts on December 1st. Like your goal is to get to December 1st feeling as good as you can. Yeah. Because you got a big one. I know. You know, it's like I start with my coach on November 18th. Like I know that yeah, I'm going to mess around the New York city marathon, but like every single thing leading up to everything is except is uh, the 18th of November. That's all that matters to me. Yeah. Getting there healthy because canyons is like a big deal. Dude. I watched Sally from okay. her last name. Okay. Yes. I saw her race last year at Coca Dona two fifty. Yeah. I, we were watching it at dinner and I literally told Lindsay, I said, this was the race. I think we talked about it one of the mm -hmm. last podcasts. I said, this was the race that got me into this running. I said, how cool would it be four years from now? Or maybe like, I don't know, maybe on my 35th birthday, I go and run Coconut 250. Like that would be like, dude, if I ever could do that, that would be something in my wildest dreams. And it's kind of like selling the the freaking dividend track, the, the software company. Never thought I would have done that. Never in my wildest dreams. And I get to say I did that in my lifetime. But that also gears me up and says, well, shit, if I can freaking do that, why can't I make my body run 250 miles? Somebody else has done it before. I, th that, that means I can do it. Do you follow her on social media? I don't. I should. Do, do you know what she just did last weekend? She won whatever the latest race was. What she was won, it? She won Moab 240. Moab 240. That's it. But yeah. that completed the Grand Slam of 200 milers. So in one year, starting in May, she ran Cocodona 250. Then she ran the Tahoe 200. Then she ran the Bigfoot 200. And then she just finished this past weekend the Moab 240 and won Moab. Wow. All since May. Like she got first place. She won the race overall. She Man. won the female triple crown, which is just the Tahoe 200, um, Bigfoot 200, and then Moab 240. That's the triple crown. And then the Grand Slam throws in Cogadona as well. Unreal. She just finished that. Unreal. And they're all YouTube documented. Go to her channel. I, yeah, I just watched the Co Cocodona one. Oh we're my gonna, gosh, dude! I I'll tell you when I plan to do it. Um, so I'm, I want to do. I'm gonna do it 100 this year or coming up. 24. I'm gonna do 100, 
and then one in the fall and then one in the uh, one in the spring and one in the fall 100 miler yeah okay and then i think the fall might be a little longer maybe 150 200 mm -hmm. k maybe you know it's like 125 okay um and then the following october 25 I want to run Moab 240. Yeah, I'm not ready for that yet. I'm still nervous as hell about a 100K a year from now. I know, you're going to smoke it. Just think I about so. that. I hope so, dude. Just think I about that podcast episode when you're like, yo, Brad, I fucked up your time. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of training to do, man. I have a lot of training, but I'm ready to, like, I'm ready to attack it. I do. I, I also, so you mentioned your races. So September will be the race, the 100K grindstone. I will say I want to run a marathon and a 50K before that. There is a one the biggest marathon in Jacksonville. It's like the the Don. I think it's called like the Donna Marathon or whatever. It's uh, it's the mayor of Jacksonville. She had breast cancer, and so everyone in the running space I've talked to has mentioned it. So, so it's a big marathon in February and I think I'm going to sign up for that. Yes. So then once I get done with this 10 miler, I'll be training for that marathon. That'll help me get ready for the 100 K and I'll be training for that as well. So it's just like a stepping stone. And if I can throw a random trail run 50 K in there before the 100 K, that's kind of my goal. I got one. 50 K. Yeah. Big Let's horn, do it. Big horn June. Oh, the one you told me about. Father's Day. I know. I want to do it, man. I told you I'm on board. I might want to do the 52 miler. 52. What's that? They have a hundred. It's not, it's a hundred and a, a 52, not a hundred and a 50, but there's also a 50 K. Okay. So do you want to do 50 K? I'll run 50 K with you. We'll see. I, I, I don't know, dude. I don't know where I'm going to be at there. Then <laughs> I know. Will you get some fucking stability in your life, please? <laughs> I, I would tell me about it, bro. <laughs> I don't even know if I'm going to be living in Florida then. <laughs> this guy's half moved out already. Look at those books on the floor. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, dude. Uh, well, I'm excited to document the journey, though. I am, dude. I'm excited to see how far you and I both come. Because, like, you, you've done a major body trans transformation, which has been freaking motivating as hell to watch and i was on my way there but then this injury really set me back so i'm excited to see where the next like now that i know it's not a, a severe injury i am excited to see where the next year you and i both are yeah and it's been fun i've been very fortunate where it's been over a year for me that i've been going right and it's really awesome to have that documentation and look back and because a year can go by so fast, but like I posted my reels the other day, uh, a, a year ago, I made a video on YouTube about how ecstatic mm. I was that I broke 30 minutes in a 5k. That's so crazy. And like, I'm like on the camera and I'm like, Oh, I knew it'd be close. I knew it'd be close. But oh my God. It was, Oh God, I think I got like 2950. I think I did it, baby. And I'm so fired up. And I'm like, not to sound like I can't do it that slow now. I run a 20 minute, I took 10 minutes off a three mile race in a year. Wow, that's and crazy. I just can't wait as we dream and we hope. Like when we have an episode about you doing Coca Dona and we have this, oh my it's God. like. Man, we were such scared little wimps. I know. But yeah, I think just signing up for stuff, uh just signing oh, up for it and making a goal like this backyard ultra I just signed up for December 9th. Like the last one I was like, let's go find out what this race is about. This one I I have like high expectations for myself and that's another fun thing that's come along with the training is like you start to feel like a runner, you know? Yeah. And I never thought I would, I think one of the major reasons I didn't like running was I, I was like, I knew I could never quote, be good at it. So like I self-sabotaged like, oh fuck running. Cause I knew I couldn't be, I was so competitive and I knew that like I was on, I was in the wrong league. But now that like, if I go to a local 5k for, for my age group, I'm, I'm going to do probably pretty well. 
Yeah. And that's crazy, man. It's, it's nuts. It's Dude, so I, nuts. I heard something the other day real quick, and then we can we can close this up. But there's uh, there, I don't know if it was a video or what, but it said, this blew my mind. 95% of Americans over the age of 30 will never sprint again in their lives. Think about that for a second. And it's so true. That means if you know 100 people over 30, 30, 95 of them haven't sprinted since their 30th birthday. Wow. Or probably before that. That's insane, dude. Insane. But I made a tweet the other day. I was like, the average American is divorced, overweight, and in debt. We're trying to push through all of those things. All of them. If you can get take advantage of all three of those, dude, I'm telling you, your life is going to be so much better and more enjoyable. I was talking to my students about this because they make fun of me because I'm old, right? And uh, the, one of them was like, Finn, how old do you think you have to be before it's acceptable that you can't do a pull-up anymore? One pull-up? Yeah. He's like... So- He's like, you say you're 20, you're like, come on, man, one pull up. But you say you're 80, you're like, dude's 80. Mm-hmm. So they were looking for like, what's that number? And I'm going to ask you what it is, and then I'll tell you what they said it was. For uh-huh. me? Well, like if you had to put a number on that, what do you personally think okay. is an age where you'd be like, all right, man, fair play, you're getting old. I would say, like, are you asking me for like the average American or like for myself? No, like if you had to, if you had to set the standard for you, okay, like what right. age do you think it is? And I just um, want to compare it to what age they thought it should be. So for one pull up, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna be kind of nice here. Uh, I'll say like 65. Okay, no, like yeah, obviously, like no other circumstances that would keep you from doing right, pull up right. involved. Like just an average person that like used to go to gym class, right? So you think if they're 64, they should still be doing pull ups? Yes. I should at least be able to do one pull up. Yes. All right. What do you, do you, my kids, what do you think they said? 35. What? Yep. They said, thir- I was going to say 55, but they said 35, 30, dude. 35. And I said, guys, I'm 41. And they're like, yeah. If I think about all my teachers that, are over 35, you're probably the only one that I have that can do a pull-up. What? And I'm like, and then they're like, yeah, my dad can't do a pull-up. And they're like, yeah, my dad can't do a pull-up. And like, what? and it's just like their perception of what fitness should be and how important it is to life is so distorted from my, I I said 50. I said, if you're 50 years old, I'm cool with that. Like, I think people up only because I'm 41. So I I can see myself like I should be able to do a pull for at least nine more years. That's how I came up with 50. But when they were like, and like I said, when they, when I say, guys, I'm over that age, they're like, yeah, we accept you, but nobody else. I was like, holy cow. That's insane, dude. But it aligns exactly with what you just said. 30 years old. True. <clears throat> nobody sprints anymore. But Wow. But I think it's just like anything, like smoking or like drinking. Like you have to figure it out on your own. You can't be told to. True, a hundred and fifty percent. I agree with you on that. If, you if, cannot be told. Yeah, like it's you something can't, inside of you that needs to change for you to. Yeah, you can't be like, oh, I heard Brad and JJ talking about running, and I should go running. Like it should be. I heard Brad and JJ talking about running, and I've been thinking about running, and I probably should. All right, fuck it. I'll go do it. That's what it should be. Like, that's the push I I, want to have on people. Yeah. Like my biggest thing, dude, was like, I thought of it this way. Like this was, I think the turning point for me is one, I'm, I am getting older. Like I'm still relatively young. I'm 32, but I'm getting old. I'm I'm at that threshold now where like, I'm officially old. Like when I hear videos and people on the news, older males, 30 and over, I'm like, oh shit, I'm in that group now. That was my first thing is like, I really do need to get my fitness under control. I also heard another saying out there was saying, you can fuck around in your 20s and be fine. 
you can fuck around in your thirties and be all right, but still have a harder time catching up. But when you get into your forties, if you've been fucking around your 20 and 30 year olds, like fitness wise, <laughs> you're going to screw up. Your forties are going to be tough. You're, they're going to be hard. Yeah. Now, if you can do, if you can get your stuff straight twenties and thirties, that's going to make your forties, fifties and sixties be that much better, that much easier. So I'm like, I got to change something. I was fat. I was out of shape. I was drinking, you know, doing all that shit. And I cannot imagine continuously doing that over and over and over until I'm 70 years old and expect to be living a super healthy life at that age. So also, the other fact with that is my kids. I wanted my kids to see me as a dad who was in shape, can do anything I need to. And I also want to be a dad that when I walk around, like my son looks up to me and he's like, or my daughter looks up to me and they're like, yeah, my dad, you know, my dad ain't no joke. And then I look at some dads out there and I see they're just like, they're just, you know, fat, overweight, lazy. They don't want to do anything. They don't want to get out of their chair to play with their kids. That's not the dad I want to be. Yeah, they, they they can be they can be that version of themselves. I'm not. I don't care about them. I, that's not. I'm what I not. Want. That's no not way. What I want. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah, more power to them if they want to do that. Me, no way. I yeah, would no never way. want to live my life like that. You know, if that hurts feelings, I'm sorry, but that's just not the way I want to live. Yeah, I, I, I'm like more of like the camp of, I never want to be dad used to. Watch me be like the fattest 45 year old dad out there. <laughs> Someone like plays this back 15 years from now. Like, hey, what happened, dude? <laughs> yeah, like I don't um, want I don't want to be dad used to play with us or dad used to always go on a bike ride with us or right. dad always brought us to a game or dad always like dad used to. I, I just don't want to be dad used to ever. Mm -hmm. And I found myself getting to that point already when my kids were young. Like I wanted to be I never wanted there to be a time where Avery was like, dad, you want to, can you push me on the swing? And I had any reason to be like, nah, not right now. I'm busy. Like, right. and I'm not saying I yes, my kids all the time, but I think about being able to say yes more with added fitness and just a general over mental health, everything about me. I Brody just learned how to ride a bike. And I ran up and down the street with them because they don't know how to stop. They don't know how to turn. They know how to go in a straight line. And I have a short, short street. So like I must have ran two miles with the kid that day. And it was hot. It was summer. I was like, I wouldn't have been able to do this. Like it would have been a disaster or, or like I throw, I'm the dad that throws the kids in the pool all day. Mm -hmm. I'm the dad when a kid comes over to the house and like I throw them, the dad's like, don't do something once. You don't want to have to do a thousand times. Oh, and then yeah. an hour, then an hour later, I'm still just throwing his kid around the pool. Like that's the dad that, that I wanted to be and why I, you know, like I was talking to one of my students who actually like blew my mind and he was like, oh, what the heck did he say? I just lost my train of thought. Oh yeah. Like the sacrifices that he made, he's going to like one of the Ivies to play lax or whatever. And he's like, you know, I had to realize that if I wanted, if I, if I wasn't willing to sacrifice parties and hanging out with my friends, the sacrifice would become going to Ivy. So he's like, so I sacrificed the somewhat normal high school for the opportunity to not suffer in like what I really wanted to. And I was like, damn, that's so smart. It's awesome, dude. He's yeah. beyond his ears. And you're going to have to sacrifice things. And for me, and like the context that I'm putting that in, like I'm sacrificing not drinking today. Don't know about tomorrow, but I'm not drinking today because, because of that reason. Like I'm willing to sacrifice drinking for the person I wanted to be. And if I kept drinking, then that's not really the person that I wanted to be. And I just, yeah. I don't know where I was going with that. I'm getting babbly. It's late. Yeah. I'm doing the same thing. 
I don't even know how long we've been recording. We, can, I think we can go. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it was good. It was a good talk. Let's go. Uh, Coca Dona. Two fifty <sighs> in four years. The, we'll do it. We'll do it on their ten year anniversary, which I think is six years away. Perfect. We'll do the ten the ten year anniversary one. Get in the Discord. Tell us what you're doing. Yep. Corey, you're a rock star, dude. Congrats, Thanks. buddy. Thanks so much, and we look forward to the next person. It's gonna be debt free going on runs. Yeah, baby. All right, good night, guys. <laughs>